The Bad Batch is coming to an end, so it's time to talk about some Season 3 speculation. Hello there, welcome back to the channel, I am Grand Moff Tony. Now, I absolutely love The Bad Batch. I'm not even gonna try and sugarcoat that, I adore The Bad Batch. And nobody saw that coming less than me, because I was one of those people who, when Season 7 of Clone Wars came out, was like, oh, okay, we have to spend the first four episodes of this final season setting up a spin-off show. Yeah, I was one of those people. But in retrospect, having had the first two seasons of The Bad Batch show and followed these characters along their story, that very, very first arc back in Clone Wars has become one of my favourite Bad Batch stories, because it's the story where they're all together. You get to see them all together, and they're all working together, and they all like each other before everything goes horribly wrong. Yeah, I really love this show, and I love these characters, and I love this story, this proper, raw, soldier story. It really became apparent to me on my latest rewatch of Star Wars canon that you spend so much time with the clones in the prequels now. That changed in Revenge of the Sith when they go from being the good guys to the bad guys is so jarring. And it takes you so long to get used to the fact that, oh, if you see a clone trooper, that's bad. Clone trooper bad. And you're basically along for the ride with these soldiers of fortune who have been betrayed by their government. They're basically the A-team in Star Wars, and I bloody love it. So with season three coming and the realization that this is the final season of The Bad Batch, what do I think is going to go down? How do I think this story is going to end? How do I hope it's going to end? So I I figured this would be a fun thing to do, just sit and talk about my personal hopes, fears, speculations for everything Bad Batch Season 3. We're going to talk about returning story arcs, we're going to talk about returning characters, and I'm going to give you my final Deadpool for who I think is going to make it out the other end, because I love these characters so, so much, and I would love nothing more than for them all to have a happy ending, but how likely is that in Star Wars? Let's find out. Let's get into this. So a big kind of question that's hanging over our heads from Season 2 to is who are the clone assassins? Who are these brainwashed clones running around looking like bounty hunter droids but acting as imperial assassins? Who are they? Like, what is their role? Where have they come from? Is it Hemlock? I feel like it's probably Hemlock. It feels like this is probably his work because in season two he's talking about creating a perfect society, creating perfect life forms. And as opposed to the Empire, the idea of a perfect life form is an obedient life form, one that obeys without question, and that seems to be what these clone assassins are. They seem to be the perfected Kaminoan Jango Fett archetype that has been completely brainwashed into being a loyal Imperial soldier. They only really showed up for that one two-part arc in the middle of season two on Coruscant, but they do seem to be leaning into this idea with the footage from the third season's trailer. I'm seeing a lot more clones looking like that one clone in their in their dark armor looking kind of, kind of droid-like and kind of vacant, and that really does kind of thematically tie in, because one of the biggest things about the clones is they say they're not droids. They don't just blindly follow orders, they have their own decision-making, their own morality to guide their choices. They all have a choice. Well, what if the Empire were to take away that choice? What if they were to turn these clones effectively into organic droids? I'm sure that would make the Emperor very happy, I'm sure that would make Hemlock very happy, but what does it mean for the clones? Well, for the clones, Clones, it means there's only really one way left to survive, and that's rebellion. We've kind of been building to that with the stuff with Rex. He seems to be going around rescuing clones who are kind of finding their way out of their programming. He's helping them get rid of their chips. He's going to do the same thing for Wolf. Wolf, of course, is returning for this season, so we might get to see that. And I remember back on the original Battlefront 2 game, there was a mission in The Rise of the Empire that took place on Kamino, where some clones remained loyal to the Republic, and they were being targeted by the then clones that had joined the Empire. It was kind of a clone-on-clone -clone civil war, which was kind of cool. Obviously, we can't do that on Kamino now because Kamino is gone. But the idea of a clone rebellion, the idea of clones waking up and realizing, hey, we're being screwed over by the Empire, that's definitely something we could explore in this season. Speaking of Hemlock, just what is going on at Mount Tantis? We know they're working with the Zillow Beast. We know that he is trying to take cloning in new directions, and I suspect 
suspect that he is behind these droid-like clone assassins. But really, what is the deal with Tantis? What are we going to see there? There's a lot of footage in the trailer of the Emperor visiting Mount Tantis, and that kind of leads me to thinking, are we getting into some Sith Eternal stuff? Is creating a Force-sensitive clone what Palpatine is trying to do at this point in the timeline to sort of ensure himself? Because it seems to be a scientific endgame that they are still working towards at the time of the Mandalorian. They're still trying to figure out how do you create a Force-sensitive clone. So is that the Tantis endgame? Are they working towards creating that Sith Eternal Emperor that we see in The Rise of Skywalker? Maybe. So could we start to see the foundations of that final order being set up this far back in the timeline? I mean, even though he just won the galaxy, he's already planning for when someone's going to betray him, and he's going to have to take it all back. Will we see Sid again? Do we even want to? I mean, what are we working towards with Sid here? Are we going to get, like, a Lando redemption arc, or are we going to get a DJ sod your redemption arc? I don't know with Sid, to be honest. I'm still, I'm still mad at Sid, so uh, I'm personally of the mind that I either don't want to see her again, or I really don't need a redemption arc for her. I mean, I'll accept one if she gets one, but I don't want to see her anymore. I'm so fed up with Sid. We didn't see Sid in the trailer, but we did see Fee, so it's entirely likely that she will be the connecting person through which the Bad Batch gets back in touch with Sid if she is coming back. I don't know, man. Part of me is like, I kind of prefer that she just turns out to be a terrible person after all, and that's the end of it. And Pabu. Will the Empire find Pabu? Will they ruin this perfect little corner of the galaxy like they've ruined everything else? Probably. The trailer does seem to heavily suggest that the Empire is going to launch an invasion of Pabu, and there's a figure in those invasion shots that I'm going to come back to in just a minute. You know, thematically, this has been the story of loyalty versus morality. It's the loyalty of the clones versus their understanding of right and wrong, like questioning bad orders. And you see that best in the contrast between Order 66 and Plan 99. Order 66 is betray your leaders. Plan 99 is sacrifice yourself for your team. That's how the Bad Batch does things. They have found a way to make their morality, their loyalty to each other. And I would really like to see more of that this season. I'd like to see more of the Bad Batch defining themselves by their loyalty to one another. You know, it really feels like at the end of season one, Crosshair is legitimately upset that his team just left him behind. They didn't give him a chance. And then at the end of season two, it's Tech that says we have to go back for Crosshair. If there is a chance that Crosshair wants to come home, we have to go back for him. I've really, really enjoyed exploring how these characters define themselves by their loyalty to one another. And a character that really exemplifies that, defining themselves by their loyalty to their clan, to their tribe, is the returning Asajj Ventress. I am so, so thrilled that she's back. I'm so, so happy. But of course I read all the books, so I was naturally wondering, hmm, how is this going to play in with, you know, her being dead and all because of Dark Disciple? Well, the good news is they have made it clear that any new stories with Ventress will fall in line with Dark Disciple. Dark Disciple is not being erased, no matter what all those grumpy middle-aged naysayers who have probably never even read the bloody book have told you. So if Dark Disciple is still canon and the ending is still canon, how does that play into her return? Are we looking at a flashback, maybe? There are several scenes in the trailer that seem to show the Batch wearing their old armor, and in fact Crosshair being there as well. Is that the nature by which we're going to be reintroduced to Ventress? Maybe. But I think something that a lot of people are forgetting is that Ventress is a night sister. Dying and coming back to life is kind of their thing. So if Ventress has indeed been resurrected and she's now alive during the time of the Galactic Civil War, what is that universe going to look like to Ventress? I mean, she wasted her life fighting for one false master after another until she ultimately found her home with the Night Sisters just in time for Grievous to sweep in and destroy them all. What does this mean for Merin? What does this mean for Dathomir and the rest of the Night Sister race? Night Sisters are kind of becoming a big deal in canon with the return of the Great Mothers in the Ahsoka series. So yeah, I'm really curious, what kind of role is she going to be playing here? Is she going to be someone who is, like, morally neutral? Is she going to be a bounty hunter? Kind of seems like she is, like she's picking up her old bounty hunting habits. And it does seem like we're heading towards some kind of showdown with the bounty hunters already in the series, with both Fennec and Cad Bane appearing in the trailer. I feel like we're building up to something awesome here. Naturally, the episode titles for the season are incredibly 
vague. They kind of suggest that we are doing a Tantis arc, like, right off the bat at the start of the season. There's a very obvious two-parter with infiltration and extraction, which immediately made me think of my favourite two levels from that old Bounty Hunter game, which were the break-in and the break-out, when you have to spend one level breaking into a high-security prison, and then another level breaking out of it. Harbinger has a great name, Identity Crisis is something else I'm going to come back to when I talk about the stuff at the end of the video. And then the finale, the cavalry has arrived, it kind of gives you the idea of everything coming together, like all the people that the Bad Batch has met, all of the lives that they've touched, maybe coming together to help them out in one last struggle. I really hope so. But let's get into the real meat and potatoes of what I wanted to talk about in this video. Who do I think is going to make it? Let's talk about my Bad Batch Season 3 Deadpool. Who do I think is going to survive and who do I think is on the way out? Starting out with Hunter, I'm still very, very torn on him. His whole arc this series has been about adaptability. It's about change. It's about moving forwards. You know, first he had to adapt to being part of an empire. Then he had to adapt to being on his own, becoming a mercenary, looking after Omega. And Omega really is his hope for a new life. And he has lost her. Omega represents everything that Hunter wants. The quiet, life, to stop fighting, to put his weapons away, and just have a good life. And right now, that good life is in Imperial custody, so I imagine he is going to do absolutely anything he can. I think he's going to stop at nothing to get her back. And I do think that goes all the way up to and including sacrificing himself for her, because let's be perfectly honest, Hunter would sacrifice himself for any member of the Bad Batch. Any one of them. He would lay down his life for any one of them. And that's why I'm still 50-50 on whether or not I think Hunter's gonna make it. I would love for him to make it. I would love for him to get to live that life that he desperately, desperately wants. But on the other hand, I can 100% see him laying down his life so that the rest of his team can live that life in his stead. So, Hunter, 50-50. Let's talk about Echo. Echo has never really adapted to the new life as well as Hunter did. Echo was always, oh, we're soldiers, why aren't we doing soldier things? Are they, why are we working for mercenary people? We're supposed to be soldiers. He's always wanted to go off and help Rex, and he did that for a period during season two, but he came back. He chose to come back to the team. And even so, that mercenary life never really agreed with him. He's always kind of struggled to balance his new life with what he wants to be, which he wants to be a soldier. That is the identity that he has chosen. I feel like Echo is going to make it, but there's one nagging piece of evidence to the contrary, and that is that if Echo survives this whole incident, then where is he when we catch up with Rex and Wolf and Gregor in Rebels? Because if there was one place in the galaxy that Echo would be at that point, it would be with Rex. So, absolute best case scenario, by the time that Kanan and Ezra are finding Rex and Wolf and Gregor, Echo is off somewhere living happily with the rest of the Bad Batch, because he's finally decided, you know what, this is where I belong. Echo is going to get my most likely going to survive. Let's talk about Wrecker. Wrecker is probably my favourite member of the team, and he is the one that I want to live the most. He is the most scarred, the most damaged member of the crew, physically and mentally. He's got that great big scar across his face. He went through the trauma of having Order 66 activating inside of him, very nearly making him kill his team. And I think that's why I love him so much. It's, he is the most dangerous member of the team, and yet he is the most lovable out of all of them. And and that's why I want him to live. Even though I could see him going full Hodor and like putting himself between his brothers and an unstoppable enemy and just giving everything he's got. Now, I, I, I desperately want him to live. Wrecker, I'm saying I want him to live. Crosshair, everybody's favourite politically backwards uncle that goes crazy at every family dinner. Now, Crosshair has been on a slow burn to redemption ever since the start of the series. You know, back when we thought it was his inhibitor chip, and then we find out, nope, this is just, this is just the way that he is. And then his brief fleeting appearances in season two as he's gradually figuring out that 
that he means nothing to the Empire. His loyalty means nothing. His life means nothing. Until he finally starts to realise that he cares more about protecting his team than he does protecting himself. Now let me be perfectly clear here, I want Crosshair to live. I love Crosshair so, so much. If Wrecker is my favourite member of the team, Crosshair is my favourite member who is no longer part of the team. I want him to live, I want him to have his redemption, and I want him to live. That's a very, very important thing because Star Wars has this habit of giving a character a redemption and then immediately killing them. Like telling us that redemption means death. You get to do one good thing to redeem yourself and then it's done. I would love for Crosshair to redeem himself by rescuing Omega from Mount Tantis, but then have to prove himself all over again to his brother, or at least have him feel like he has to prove himself to his brothers, and maybe he never had to. Like, maybe they accepted him back in a heartbeat, but he felt like he had to prove himself. I really want that for Crosshair. I want a proper, fully realised redemption arc. Crosshair gets my vote to live. And finally, Tech. Is he really dead. Now, I don't know where I fall on this because I would be happy either way. I would be happy if Plan 99 is how Tech went out. I would gladly accept that sacrifice and I would be satisfied. But speculation runs amok about whether Tech is alive or not. Now, the only thing that Hemlock was able to recover were Tech's goggles. Now, back in the day, I couldn't find a body was filmmaking subtitles for this character is still alive. Now, we started to cotton on to that pretty quick. Even in Revenge of the Sith, there's a moment where they say they did they can't find Yoda's body, and Master Meter is like, well, then that means he's not dead. Now, the writers have learned from this. They have adapted, and now it's like if they find one piece of clothing, or one scattered remnant, or maybe a bionic hand, or a pair of goggles, that is new filmmaker subtext for this character is still alive. Because if he is dead, then where is his body? So on the one hand, Tech is dead. On the other hand, Tech is not dead. And if he's not dead, then where is he? I have a couple of theories on this. Now, my first theory is my favourite one, and that is he's alive, he is in hiding. He managed to crawl away from the wreckage, he left his goggles behind to kind of give them the idea that, I guess, a tram falling on him utterly eviscerated his body. He's in hiding and he's going to make a triumphant return at some point in the series and we'll all go, ah, it's Tech, he's back. Another theory is that he is alive and Hemlock simply lied about not being able to find his body and he has Tech locked up somewhere, maybe in Mount Tantis. Maybe they're going to find him as part of the breakout. Or maybe, maybe, maybe he is dead and Hemlock has done something potentially worse. Now, I want to talk about that episode title, Identity identity crisis. What if Hemlock has successfully cloned an evil tech? Now they say all the way back in season one, Rampart says, if only they were fighting for us instead of against us. The Empire want their Bad Batch. They want someone to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these people. Epic clash between the Bad Batch and Delta Squad at some point, that would be great. But what if Hemlock has succeeded? What if he has created an evil tech, either by recovering tech and brainwashing him and turning him into one of these clone assassins, or by cloning an entirely new tech and elevating him to maturity a lot faster than they've been able to before. This kind of reminds me of the whole Data and B4 from Star Trek Nemesis, where Data goes out at the end of the movie, and then there's B4 who's left over, and at the very, very end of the movie, there's kind of a suggestion that B4 could learn to be Data. Like, he could learn to be that person. He could learn to get that back. So maybe we'll get that with Evil Tech. Maybe Evil Tech is the way that Tech comes back. Like, maybe the Bad Batch somehow incapacitate evil Tech, and they're able to either break his brainwashing or just remind him who he is. I would love that. I think that would be brilliant. I think it would be heartbreaking in the first instance. I think it would be terrifying to have a cloned evil Tech coming after the Bad Batch, but I feel like it would be a really solid story arc. And then they could teach evil Tech to be not evil Tech. So if Tech is dead, then he is dead. If Tech is not dead, either because he has survived or he has been cloned, then I want him to live. That's, that's just that. You're probably sensing a pattern here. 
I want these characters to have a happy ending. I want them to get the life that they deserve, and I want it so, so badly. I don't want this to go the way of the Rogue One team, where they just go down one after the other after the other. I love these characters, and I want them to have a happy ending. That is my ultimate wish for this series, is that they get Omega back, they get Crosshair back, somehow they get Tech back, and they live happily ever after. So, there you have it. There is my speculation and hopes and dreams for Bad Batch Season 3. So let me pass this subject off to you. What would you like to see in the final season of The Bad Batch? I'm always really, really interested to hear from you guys, and I'll get back to each and every one of you. We will most likely be doing a special podcasty type episode at the end of the series, the same way we did for the Ahsoka series, where we'll sit down, we'll discuss our thoughts and our feelings about how the series played out. It seemed to go over really, really well for Ahsoka, so we will be doing it again. In the meantime, however, I've been Grand Moff Tony. Those were my hopes and dreams for Bad Batch Season 3. You may subscribe when ready.